Hello, welcome to the Seekers Forum guest interview series. I'm excited to welcome Esther Perel to the Seekers Forum this month. Esther is one of the most insightful and provocative voices on personal and professional relationships and the complex science behind human interaction. She's the best-selling author of Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence, which has been translated into 25 languages, uh, and has also been featured in two TED Talks, which together have attracted some 10 million viewers. Esther's specialty is the paradoxical nature of human interaction in intimacy, which is why I wanted her to talk to us this month. Her new book is called The State of Affairs and examines the phenomenon of infidelities, not uh, for any prurient reason, but infidelity as a doorway to deeper conversation about the places we are blocked, the places we feel we can't communicate with one another, and all of the uh, reasons that people do stray in relationships that often have very little to do with sex itself. So it's a thrill to have uh, Esther with us, and I hope that you enjoy our conversation. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Esther, I'd like to start with something that you say about affairs having a lot to teach us about relationships and eros and human nature. What does infidelity have to teach us about love and relationships, in your opinion? Uh, Basically, the story of infidelity or adultery or affairs which is basically the parallel story that has accompanied marriage from its inception, encompasses the entire human drama. The dilemmas of love and desire, our longings, our yearnings, our aspirations, our transgressions, on the one hand, our rebellion, and on the other side, uh, our experience of rejection, of abandonment, of betrayal, of violation of trust, of loss, of being on the receiving end of duplicity, of lies, of jealousy, of possessiveness, of vengeance. I mean, basically, opera understood that, and Russian novelists understood that, (laughs) French novelists too, for that matter, that this one very complex, multi-determined human experience really is a window into the crevices of the human heart in more ways than we can even imagine. So it's a lens for me because it encompasses so many aspects of our longings and our losses. Mm -hmm. What are some of the misconceptions about infidelity? I think one of the main misconceptions today, because modern infidelity is very different and very differently conceived than traditional infidelity. But in modern infidelity, which sits on top of the romantic ideal that you find the one, And that if you have everything that you need at home, you absolutely have no reason to go looking elsewhere. Hence, if you do, by definition, an affair is a symptom of a flawed relationship. An affair is a symptom of a relationship gone awry. And if you don't apply the deficiency model to the relationship, then you apply the deficiency model to the person. The person who strays is selfish, immature, narcissistic, addicted, borderline, Uh, insecure attachment, you name it. And the person who is not straying is considered the committed partner, the mature partner, the stable partner, the non-selfish partner. So one of the misconceptions is that it's a symptom theory. Second thing of the misconception is that it's a deficiency model. There must be something wrong either in you or in your relationship or this wouldn't happen. Third misconception is that the betrayal of infidelity sits on top of all of the other hierarchies of relational betrayals. Therefore, the person who exhibits infidelity is more troubled than the person who didn't stray, as if that is the marker for their relational quality. The next misconception is that affairs must be the deal breaker, that they are forever beyond repair. Six, that nothing good can come out of it. Mm. Seven, that once you cheat, always a cheater. I'd, li- I'd like to stop right there. You talk about, <laughs> that's, you, a, that's a few of them already. Yeah, no? You talk about uh, nothing good, the idea that nothing good can come of them. And you say, in fact, that some affairs inspire change that was sorely needed. Can you give an example of that with somebody you've worked with? I mean, you know, in many couples, there has never been a conversation about sexuality. 
And there has never been a conversation about sexual boundaries. And there has never been a conversation about why there is constantly one giver and one taker. And that basically, an affair upsets the status quo. An affair, an affair highlights the scorecards and its limitations. An affair yields conversations that have not happened and that should have happened in the beginning, but that people are afraid to have because if you have them in the beginning, what does that mean? Mm. If you already have to have them at the start. So people don't have them. And affairs actually become the opportunity to discuss sexuality in particular, sexual boundaries and monogamy as a second, but every other aspect of the relationship too. I mean, many times couple will tell you after the affair is revealed that for the first time they're having conversations that they haven't had in years. They finally are talking. Honestly, deeply, as if, you know, now that there is nothing left to lose, they can finally go for it. It's more often than not that people will, I mean, not, you know, what, when I say more often than not in my office, that doesn't mean it's the same in the society at large, but very frequently people will come in and say, we've had conversations like we haven't had in years. You know, one person has been giving himself or herself all kinds of permissions while the other person was always home making sure that uh, permissions even in life, you know, one person had activities, one person had outside friendships, one person traveled, one, while the other one was manning the fort the whole time, you know, figuring that they needed to do this for the greater good. And then when this thing topples the balance, then it becomes, you know, it's all the compromises that I needed to make or that I made that I'm no longer so sure I want to make now. Because when I had a good reason to do them, because I thought it was for us and for the good of us and all of that, I was willing to do it. But now that you broke the contract, why should I continue to do something which I wasn't so keen on doing in the first place, but agreed to do, you know, for the team kind of thing? It's really that, but certainly sexuality. I mean, people, you know, a lot of couples have never talked about the sexuality between them. The presence of it, the lack thereof, the quality of it, the satisfaction and dissatisfaction, the longings, the unmet needs, you name it. An affair suddenly brings the subject of sexuality to the forefront. Mm. And is it primarily shame that prevents people from having that conversation, would you say? No. I think the first thing that makes people not have the conversation is that uh, on sexuality, you mean? Yes. No, people, are, people grow up learning to be silent about their sexuality. Where exactly are they going to learn to talk about it suddenly? Right, but aren't we shamed into silence? Yes, shame, reservation, prudishness, you know, all kinds of different cultural systems that make sexuality shrouded in secrecy and in silence. But shame being one of them, guilt being another of them, ignorance is third, all kinds of social stereotypes are fourth. And, and I think the romantic notion, in the beginning, you shouldn't bring anything up because that instantly means, you know, if I say in the beginning that I'm missing something, you instantly are going to think that that means that you're not enough. Mm, right. You know, the whole notion of one person for everything and you are everything and you are enough gets instantly challenged when you start to talk with somebody about wanting more and or wanting something else. Then in, they take it instantly personal as a failure of them as something lacking in themselves, and so you don't speak about it. Mm. At first, you don't talk about it because you don't want to hurt, you don't want to offend, you don't want to scare, you don't want to make be rejected, you don't want them to leave you, whatever the reason. So in the beginning, you don't talk for a host of reasons, and later, you don't talk for a different host of reasons. Mm. And people don't know how to talk about it. They've never had these conversations. They don't know how you know, to, to, to have them. You know, Real sexual conversations are enormously intimate. In the beautiful sense of the word, actually, because they reveal so much about who we are and what we want and, you know, and what are the emotional needs that we bring to our sexuality and, and, and how we connect to ourselves and how we connect to a partner. There's such a rich tapestry that can be revealed through the conversations, but the vast majority of couples have never had those talks. They talk, you know, they can ask, what do you like? Do you like me? If I, do you like to be touched on your left ear? Right. Right. That's a very different conversation. Right. And yet you say that there are fulfillments that a marriage can never provide. What, what do you mean by that and what sorts of fulfillments might those be? Different ones for different people. I mean, you may choose a partner who is your intellectual equal, 
and he may not be your 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 most compatible sexual partner. Oh, I see. So the first thing is just the basic. It's that there is not one person who can fulfill all your needs. The second thing is in the in the duality between security and adventure, which this is still a continuation of that same framework, you may have chosen someone with whom one side of the equation is more strongly affirmed than the other. You know, this is a relationship that's going to give you plenty of novelty, plenty of challenge, plenty of adventure, but maybe not the kind of stability that you also long for. This is a relationship that's going to give you a lot of the stability that you never even hoped to get in your life. But this is not a person with whom you're going to be, you know, adventuresomeness. This is this person brings you something else. And furthermore, if you want a certain kind of intensity or that, that something about you know time and 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 continuity and and familiarity with somebody gives you other things in life, but won't necessarily give you the kind of uh, lustful experiences that you may have when you meet someone at first and you are massively curious about penetrating the mystery of another. That's what I mean by there are some fulfillments that marriage, even a good one, that there is no such a thing as a perfect relationship. At best, it's imperfect lives and imperfect relationships. But what the things are that you may not find, I think it's not one thing specifically. It just means to say that even a good marriage leaves people with longings for certain things that this marriage will never be for them. And so then the question is, do they accept it and, and give up and make compromises and say you can't have everything in life, which is what we always did? Or do they say, I deserve more. I want to experience that thing. I'm, you know, I have 50 more years to live than I used to. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that we have more desires today, but we feel more entitled to pursue them. For one, because we live in an entitlement culture, and for two, because we feel we live in the right to happiness culture, and for three, because we live a half a century longer than we used to. Right, right, right. When you talk about the three elements of infidelity, I found that fascinating. Secrecy, sexual alchemy, and emotional involvement. You didn't say sex, you said sexual alchemy. Could you explain what that distinction is? Yes. So... I think that one of the big misconceptions is that affairs or twists or flings are about sex. And sometimes, of course, they are. But much more often, they are about desire. And that is very different. You know, the desire for what? The desire to feel special, to feel seen, to feel appreciated, to be laughed at or with, uh, the desire to be desired. That does not manifest in a, in a sexual act per se. I mean, a affairs are erotic plots. And they make you feel alive. And sometimes there is massive amount of sex, and sometimes there is just a longing for the sex, or the fantasies of the sex, which is part of why I've always said, you know, the kiss that you only imagine giving is just as powerful as ours of, of lovemaking, you know, just because it can carry the same charge. So that's the alchemy. The alchemy means that it's not about the actual, you know, sex. It's about the sexuality. It's the energy. It's the aura. It's the imagination of it, the anticipation of it. As much or, if, or instead of the actual experience of it or doing of it, if you want. Mm, yeah. It reminds me of Keats. It reminds me of Ode on a Grecian Urn. You know, and that heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Sometimes it's in the not doing that there's that you find the deepest intensity. Oh yes, of course. I mean, we know that absence, that a desire is rooted in absence and in longing. It's like, you know, what you can fantasize about when you don't have is often ten times richer than what you're actually gonna experience. Right, right. And you know, an affair is a perfect erotic plot because it fits the erotic equation of Jack Morin. Attraction plus obstacle equals excitement. Brilliant. And an affair is a story of attraction with massive amounts of obstacles, and hence, you know, ma massive amounts of you can call it excitement, anticipation, you know, whatever. But the the the, the whole story of an, of lovers of secret lovers is the is the obstacles, right? right. That's so. That's why the secrecy. The secrecy is in part what fuels 
the erotic intensity. The secrecy makes you feel like it's, you're doing something that is entirely yours. So it gives you, it, it gives you the sense of autonomy and the sense of freedom and the sense of sovereignty. That in itself is already erotic. And then you add to that, you know, the sexual energy. Many affairs, you, people will tell you, they, have, they, may, they may have slept with the person three, four times, but the story went on for months. And it's an important thing also because many people who have affairs often have very good sexual relationships at home. Mm. Mm. It's not necessarily that they, it's not a compensation story, but it's a, it's a different sexuality. The context is different. I'd like to talk about romantic consumerism a little bit and how it affects our understanding of infidelity. What do you mean by romantic consumerism? <laughs> it's the way that our consumer economy peddles these notions of, of finding the one, of being the one, of, of, you know, it's the entire narcissistic enhancement of I'm so special and especially since you're waiting till your mid-30s to find me, my God, you know, <laughs> I'm the one for which you stop your, your nomadic life. You know, it's one thing when you have sex for the first time when you marry. It's another thing when you stop having sex with others when you marry. So, or marry or commit, it doesn't matter. So here I am. I am that person for which you stopped your nomadic life, you know, your promiscuous life even sometimes. I must be really special. I have stopped your ruminations. I have stopped your FOMO. You know, with me, you have deleted your apps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with me, you no longer think that you can find better next door. So, you know, if I am so phenomenal that I can assuage your FOMO, that is romantic consumerism. You know, that you don't think that you can find better. Consumerism is about finding better, right? Better, younger, newer. Yes. So what you're describing is a purely selfish approach to, to love. Well, it's not just a selfish approach to love. It's the consumer approach to love. It's the consumer approach to love. Is a, is a, you can say the consumer approach to love comes with self-gratification. Yes, but I think love has often been selfish even before we had consumerism. That's not new. I think the notion of consumerism is the fact that you feel like you have massive amounts of choice. A consumer society gives you the illusion of having choice and saddles you with the freedom of being able to dabble in such amounts of choice. And at the same time, it saddles you with the tyranny of self-doubt and uncertainty about the question of if you have made the right choice. And when you say that some affairs are acts of resistance, what do you mean? This relationship is terrible. This relationship is unequal. This relationship is oppressive. This relationship is patriarchal. This relationship is suffocating. This relationship is abusive, intimidating, you name it. And I am saying no. Mm. I say no to a social status quo. I say no to a double standard that men can roam and women, you know, should be staying put at home. I say no to the fact that, you know, men are allowed to claim their sexuality and women just have to pretend that it doesn't matter to them. I say it's resisting to a bunch of social scripts in society, it's resisting to power inequities, it's resisting to poor relational arrangements. It's a way of saying no, is what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's a, An affair is a way of saying no. I'm not playing by the rules. I'm not going on as is. I'm upsetting the status quo. I'm trumping the cards. And sometimes betrayal is part of that. Because Sometimes you betray somebody else, but you feel like you are for the first time honest with yourself. Yes. You understand? I mean, I at do, this point, I the do. whole notion of betrayal is all the time, I betrayed you, I betrayed you. But sometimes when people have affairs, they actually feel like they've been betraying and lying to themselves for years. Right, right. So it's a way of taking their own side, finally. Yes. Mm. It's yeah. a revendication. I don't know how you say that in English. It's a, yeah, it's a claiming. Mm hmm you know, but it's a, that is such a controversial idea the, because, because it instantly becomes selfish rather than self-interested. 
And sometimes self-interested is not selfish. I mean, it's selfish, of course, but it's done by people who have been catering to others for decades. Got it. Got it. And for that, it, it, it really requires understanding that, you know, the transgression of infidelity or the breach of contract around affairs is, is very important, but it is not, you know, it's like one guy who said to me, at least I haven't been sleeping around, you know, and slot and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, my dear, you know, indifference, contempt, neglect, you've been treating your wife like shit for a long time, you know? That is also a marital betrayal. But, you know, we know even from women who live in shelters for battered women that they'll keep going back to the guy who hits them, but they'll finally leave them when he cheats on them. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Something about this one seems to topple all others. Mm. In, in all of your work, Esther, have you ever seen polyamory work? <laughs> yeah, many times. Have you? And what does that look like? Could you give me an example of what that looks like? A, a healthy, you know, uh, mutually uh, satisfying polyamory I mean, relationship? The first thing when I want to know about work, you mean what? That the people live together for 60 years? No, no, no. That all of the parties are satisfied. It's it's transparent and um, and it's, it's somehow you know, supporting all of the parties involved? I mean, I have a, one very close couple of friends who who um, who live it very beautifully. I mean, they, they do have a hierarchy. They are the primary relationship. They have the child, um, but they bring in other people to help them with the, with the, not even to help them. They bring in other people in their life that are involved as well with the child as with each other. They, there's a lot of communication about it. It requires, you know, it's a very active communication about this. And they fundamentally care about the erotic freedom of the other person. And they have what is called compersion, you know, what the poly people call compersion. They appreciate the experiences that their partner has with others. They know the people, you know, they tweak it all the time. They adapt it when they are during different stages, when they are pregnant, when they have young babies, when they have older children. It, it breeds with them. It's not a static thing. I know many more non-monogamous couples than I know polyamorous couples. And then I know a lot of polyamorous couples who are doing it in the traditional don't ask, don't tell version, where it's very clear that both partners have long-term lovers of, of decades, of decades, people who are in their 70s today. And they have a fairly... Um, good amount of differentiation in the relationship as well as a very strong core. These are people who share their life, but they don't share every aspect of their life together. You know, and, and often they are the, their entire cohort is long divorced and remarried sometimes. And they have lasted, but they have lasted because they have actually had different kinds of marriages, different kinds of relationships with each other. Mm-hmm. There are lesser of them because we prefer because it demands much more work. And, uh, you know, this is not so good anymore. It's time to divorce and to start all over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a couple more questions, Esther. First, when you say that infidelity can be seen or treated as an antidote to death, what do you Mm -hmm. mean by that? I mean that the one word that I hear all over the world when people have affairs is that they feel alive. That's, they don't talk about the fact that they're having sex. Or they feel alive. They feel like they are engaged with their life. They feel like they're doing something that they want when often they have not for a long time. They feel awake. They feel curious. They are intrigued with themselves because they're acting in ways that they have not done or never done before. They are, you know, it, on every front they describe an experience of aliveness, which often beats back the deadness inside, which isn't the fault of the marriage nor the fault of the partner, by the way. It's often the deadness that they have allowed to creep in for, for years on their own, you know. But by definition, it's a transgressive act, and transgression is, you know, is a breaking of the rules, and a breaking of the rules gives you a sense of ownership and freedom, and ownership and freedom gives you a feeling of aliveness. Mm. It's a chain. Beautiful. I'm not justifying any of it, but this is the most important thing, Mark, is I am, you know, the minute you don't condemn it, you instantly are seen as if you condone it or if you even promote it. The, I am not neither for or against or any of this. This is really about something that is, and I am guiding the conversation about it. And that's what's so wonderful about the book is you're so fair-minded. I mean, you really do look at it in the 360. You haven't oversimplified 
and you've allowed human nature to be complex, which it, it is. That's what I love so much about the way you write about these particular subjects. One last question, Esther. Uh-huh. When, when is sex a spiritual experience, in your opinion? That depends on what people define as spiritual, but, you know, for some people, the experience of sexuality is that they are entirely inside their body, and for other people is that they feel that they have totally transcended the physical boundaries of their body. You know, the transcendence is the immateriality of it. It's the, the ability to no longer feel that you are contained within a physical world. That's, for many people, the definition of spiritual, a sense of complete abdication of the self. For some people, it's a, it's a powerful union with another that transcends the borders between where one stops and where the other person starts. And that sense of infiniteness, timelessness and infiniteness. And do you consider that one of the properties of sexuality? Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Not, ever, not everybody names it like that, but yes, this is one of the most amazing beauties of it, is that, that ability to momentarily transcend you know, about the borders of, of self into something that is, you know, no longer defined by physical property and that, uh, that it is utterly unique. It's really what we call a religious experience. Beautiful. For me, the, the question isn't whether infidelity is good or bad, you know. It's really that right now the conversation about it is closed, not especially helpful. And the point that I'm trying to make is that a judgment is not going to help us with this, but to explore this com common and impactful event on our relationships in order to open up the conversation will create something that is more helpful and more healthy. And my broader critique is that the prevalence of the question is infidelity bad and all its variants speaks to a kind of an essentialist framework, you know, in which things have to be either good or bad. And typically, the notion is that the one who didn't stray is by definition good just because they didn't stray. And that is not necessarily honest, you know. Um, that's what I'm trying to, to open up here. Yes. Voilà. Yes. yes. It happens frequently. It's a major event in the lives of people and of intimate relationship. And I want to explore the phenomenon from an observational standpoint because I think that that's the only way that we're going to create something that is more evolving, more understanding, with new treatment modalities and the whole thing. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much, Esther. So Did you like the book? I love the book. I'm about two-thirds of the way through, and I'm absolutely loving it. I can think of five people I want to give it to right away. Great, <laughs> yeah. great. No, nice talking to you. You too, my dear. Thank you so much. Bye.